in the meantime then, over to Claire. Thank you very much. Hi, can you hear me okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah great. So thanks very much for coming today to my talk on small business blogging. Uh, I love blogging and I hope that you will love it too after hearing my talk. And just a little word of warning, I'm going to go through quite a long list of plugins and tools, uh, but don't feel you've got to write everything down. There's going to be a list in my slides at the end, so you don't have to get them all. I'll have the links. So I am a freelance web developer from Edinburgh in Scotland, and I work mainly with small business and third sector charities and social enterprises. And I started my business back in August 2013. So, why should you blog, you ask? Well, one thing is you'll get more traffic to your site because, as we know, Google loves fresh new content and blogs certainly provide that. And in general, the more you write, the more visitors you'll get. And you'll get visitors from your older blog posts too. It also helps your SEO and certainly I find it easier to rank for SEO for posts because I can write longer articles and they're more targeted. And because you're pr providing valuable content and if you're consistent with it, you're going to build loyalty amongst your visitors. And by doing some blogging, you will show your expertise and you'll build your credibility and become that go-to person in your niche. And certainly that's worked with people who already know me to some extent uh, that I've already networked with. It just gives me that extra credibility. Blogging is also going to help you educate other people because if you're writing about something, you obviously have to know about it first. And I like learning something and then teaching it to other people. And funnily enough, you'll actually help yourself too, because I've lost count in the number of times where I've wondered how to do a task, I've Googled it, and I've actually found my own post in search. And finally, you'll get new business opportunities, and that includes things like guest posting, it might be client inquiries, or even speaking engagements like this one. So how are you going to blog? Well, you want to have some kind of schedule for your blogging and I use an editorial calendar, that helps. And I'll mention a bit more about that <clears throat> later on. Plus there are tools that will help you to blog and save you time putting together your posts and publicizing your posts. Again, I'll show you. Um, groups are really good, online groups or offline groups. They keep you going and they give you ideas and they give you encouragement for your posting. And you need to make the time to do it because if you don't block out the time like you would with client work, then guess what, it's just not going to get done. And there's a specific right way that you want to write your blog posts. You're not writing them like you would write an essay. You don't want paragraph after paragraph on text. It's just dull and boring to read. So you, you need to structure them properly. Uh, this guy here, Rob Cubbon, uh, at robcubbon.com, is one of my inspirations. I came across him early on when I was um, starting off um, being interested in web design and development. And we've never actually met. I've emailed him a number of times. He did come to WordCamp London in 2013, but he won't be here this year because he's currently off in Thailand setting it up. And he is a graphic and web designer. He's now turned more into a digital marketer and entrepreneur and he uses WordPress and the Genesis framework. And he started his blog back in 2006. He attributes a lot of success to running a blog. He's now moved into doing eBooks and video courses, and he's got these multiple income streams. He regularly publishes income reports so that you can see what he does is actually working for him. And he's very much got a down-to-earth attitude of, well, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And that's a really positive thing. So this was actually my first blog post, and you'll notice the date. It was um, January 2014, uh, not when I started business. I was lucky and I got a bit busy and I didn't get around to building my site right away. I was posting one post a month, and I thought, well, it's not really enough, one post a month, but at least it's consistent. But I always seem to be playing kind of catch up by getting to the end of the month and thinking, oh, I've got to put a blog out. But I thought, well, it's not really enough. I've got to do a bit more. And this is the tweet that changed everything. 
Uh, I don't know about you, but I like getting free stuff. And if I find something for free, then it seems like a good thing to share with other people. And this was an ebook that was free. Um, it's given away every month or so, and it's a collation of 30 different emails for a blogging challenge. So this started up a little Twitter conversation with the author of the book, Sarah Arrow. The book is called Zero to Blogger in 30 Days. And I said, oh, I actually had got the book before. Um, and I thought, well, I said to her, I want to do more blogging. So she said, well, why don't you join in with our Facebook group? Uh, so I did. And that was not long after I'd actually joined Facebook because I, I was very suspicious of Facebook for, for years. And, and now I quite like it. Well, I like the groups anyway. And that led on to actually signing on to do the challenge. And the challenge itself is run by Sarah Arrow and her husband, Kevin. Uh, their company is Sarkey Media. And I started it off in February 2015. It was a good time for me to take it on. I just left a difficult project. I was feeling a bit down. And all of a sudden, I had a purpose. I had to do a blog post every day. It gave me something to focus on. So you're ob obviously, the aim is one post a day for 30 days. And you get an email sent to you it's about six o'clock every morning, local time, uh, giving you ideas of things to post. And, and some of the stuff I found, well, I know this already. I, I'm not going to pay special attention to keywords and things because I know a bit about that. I did, I have to say, uh, before I began, I actually pre-wrote about three of the posts because I thought, mm, this looks like it's going to be a lot of work. And I, I wanted to just give myself a little bit of a head start. Um, and like I said, you get a whole lot of ideas. I got quite excited when I came to the infographic day. I thought, this is going to be easy. This is going to be great. It wasn't easy. It was actually quite time consuming to do. Uh, it's just researching all the bits and pieces. I, put, I quite enjoyed the putting it together uh, in canva.com. But it's just it just took time. So this is the blogging challenge group, the Facebook group. And this is where everyone gets to share the posts. And you can like and comment on other people's posts. And the great part is that everybody else in the group is on the same journey, all at different stages. So every day someone posts something, they put the day that they're on. And this is so important, getting this encouragement to keep going. Um, and it's also great to just to discover new blogs out there that might have absolutely nothing to do with what you write about. So, for example, I like cooking, I like food, and I really like seeing all the food blogs because they all put like gorgeous pictures of delicious recipes on them. And I thought, that's wonderful. I want to go and make that. And the rewarding in the group is really important as well. You get these little badges when you start, when you finish. And every seven days, you get a new one saying, you know, well done, you've done seven days, well done, you've done 14. And that's just something that, again, just keeps spurring people on. And I did hear from the horse's mouth that they, they stopped doing that for a couple of months and the engagement went right down in the group. So it's really super important. And once you have completed the challenge, there's more. There's, there's a group for graduates of the challenge. Um, this has got about 200 people in it. Um, I don't know if you can see the numbers that were in the blogging group, but it's rather more than that. A lot of people start, and not so many complete it. Um, and being part of the graduates group, I can keep sharing my content in there. And there's extra goodies as well. There's interviews and bonus content just exclusively for the graduates. So what did I discover from this challenge? Well, it's definitely time consuming. And like I said, you need to block out that time. While I was actually doing it, I was finding myself right into the evenings because I was finding it took a good few hours to put together a post. And certainly for the kind of post that I write, being mainly about WordPress and web development, it takes longer. If you're going to review a product, if you've got like a new plugin or something, you've obviously got to try it out and use it. Well, if you didn't and you wrote about it, you wouldn't be terribly credible. And putting in things like videos, putting in screenshots, you have to take that same time to make an edit. Although I did find in the course of doing it, I found um, tools to take quicker screenshots, which I thought was great because that did save me time. So I, put a I wrote a post about it. 
once you start to see people actually liking and sharing and commenting your posts and you start to see your traffic increase, that makes it all worthwhile. And like I said before, you have to be persistent. A lot of people will try and not so many succeed. But having said that, life can get in the way. People kind of have to put the pause on the challenge for all sorts of reasons. I actually had to be persuaded last year. I was at WordCamp uh, Birmingham and it was the evening social and I wanted to put a post out and I had to be persuaded, no, you're allowed an evening off, you are actually allowed to enjoy yourself. So my audience seems to be a mix of people. I've got, for the more technical posts, I've got designers and developers reading those ones. Um, I got a bunch of students come to a post I wrote on uh, 2015, Making a Child theme. Um, thank you to my old uni for that. I've got some people who are just uh, lay people who are using WordPress or, or the other tools that I write about. And I like writing event reports. It's a good uh, record of what I've been to and a reminder of, of who's spoken and what they spoke about. So I'll get people who were at the same events coming. And I'll get a few potential clients in there too. So in terms of strategy, uh, research is important. You have to think, well, who, who are you actually writing for? Who is your audience? Do you know? Um, and structure the poster in that. Know your topic really well. Find out everything that you want to know about it. Find relevant links that you can put in. And then think about the SEO side of things, the keywords that people are actually going to be searching for to find your post. Um, long posts are good. There's some evidence that posts over 2,000 words actually make up the first top 10 positions in Google for a particular term. And I happen to like writing epics. I can't help myself. Um, I find that I just write and write a certain amount and then I get like Columbo and I think, oh, there's just one more thing I could add there. And then obviously the longer you write, then the more likely they are to be found for any particular search term. You want to mark up posts correctly as well. Um, you want to put headings in there and put them in the correct level order and there should only be one uh, heading one per post, which should be the title. Uh, you want to put in alt text because not only is it good for visually impaired users and you should be doing that anyway, but it can also help SEO too. And the little bit of text underneath um, the title and the link in Google, the meta description, fill that bit in as well and get keywords in. Uh, in terms of your layout of your blog, don't use justified text. That's not good for people with dyslexia to read. And break up the text with things like bullet points, images, you could put lock quotes in, you could put tweet boxes in, just anything that means it isn't a big wall of words. So a little example of some of the actual code from one of my posts, just showing the different markups. So I've got uh, the headings in order, I've got bullet, a bullet point list, and I've got some alt text in there too. So when it comes to the scheduling, make sure you are comfortable with whatever you start writing. Better to start small and build up. If, if you start three times a week and then give up after a couple of months, then it's just going to look sad. There's nothing sadder than a blog that's been abandoned. And at the worst, people might just think, oh, they've gone out of business. Doesn't look good. And obviously, a 30-day challenge is a bit of a commitment. It's a bit of a crazy one. And the, oh, did I mention, I didn't actually do it in the 30 days. I did it in 34 because I did have those days off. You do need to be regular as well uh, to build the traction. Um, and it just lets your visitors know what to expect. If you're randomly posting you know, on different days of the week, every week or something, how is somebody going to know when there's something new? When you finish writing, you want to put some kind of call to action at the end of the post. Uh, you have to assume your audience is really stupid and they're not going to do anything unless you tell them what to do. So if you want them, to share it on social media, tell them to do that. If you, if you want them to leave a comment, tell them to do that. If you want them to email you and give you lots of work, tell them to do that. And the publicity side as well, um, 
I, th I think that's something I neglected when I was doing the blogging challenge. And I've heard it said you need to spend as much time, if perhaps not more time, actually on the publicity as the writing. So you can use all sorts of things, social media, groups, forums. You can email people personally. You could just tell people when there's something that you've written that's of interest. And ideally, you should have an email newsletter and you should be emailing those people on it regularly and telling them, hey, I've just put out some more great stuff. Um, not everyone has comments enabled on the blog, but I do and I recommend having them. And if you reply to your comments, it's just showing that you're in touch with your readers. You, you can start off a little dialogue that way. And it's important as well to comment and share other people's posts. It's just good karma, because if you do that for them, the chances are they'll reciprocate and do it for you. So here's a, a little selection of topics that you could write about, not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, if you write about a problem and a solution, it's just showing off your expertise. Uh, you can ask your customers or you can find out from them what are those questions that they're always asking you and then you can answer them in a post or a series of posts. And you can write how-to posts. You could do that through text, screenshots, you could be video and audio. Um, I had one like that where I had a client, I was suggesting that she use Dropbox, she didn't know how to use it, so I just wrote a post going exactly through all the steps of putting a file on Dropbox and sharing it. And if you, if you do a post like that, you're showing, well, I can do it. So some people will think, well, that's great, you can do it. Uh, rather than me doing it, I will just get you to do it instead. Uh, everybody loves list posts. You should put in list posts every so often because they're the most shareable type of post. They do really well. And reviews or comparisons, um, you're helping people to decide on a particular product or service. Plus, of course, you're teaching yourself on it too. Event reports, like I said, it makes a note for yourself and for other people of what the event was all about. And something I just tried recently, a pricing post, uh, that is supposed to build a bit of the trust factor because when someone comes to your site, they're going to be looking, wondering on price. You don't necessarily have to explicitly say, hey, this is how much I charge, but you at least have to talk a bit about the subject. So a couple of examples from my own blog. Um, my WordPress plugin accessibility post has done quite well. It's had 89 shares and interactions, and it's page one of Google for WordPress plugin accessibility. And that one is still consistently popular when you're on. Um, I've pinned it to my Twitter page, though, so that might have something to do with it. And this is my shot at writing a pricing post. It's had 102 shares and interactions, and most of them were, it came from LinkedIn. And I've actually been told I need to push some traffic to it uh, from Facebook ads. So is anyone here a Facebook ads expert? Could you come and speak to me afterwards, please? Um, a little bit about blogging ethics. Um, it should be obvious, but don't steal other people's content. Um, be careful when it comes to pictures. Uh, there are lots of good free stock sites. I particularly like uh, Pixabay, which has uh, quite a good selection for a number of things. Not everything, but not bad. Uh, you need to read the license terms carefully with pictures, you know, check if it's got Creative Commons and you have to attribute anyone. Screenshots, perhaps, I use them a lot, but there may be a bit of a grey area. There is the fair use doctrine. I think the key question is, are you actually profiting from the use of screenshots? If you are, then you, you might need to think again, but I'm not a lawyer, so don't quote me. Um, I think outsourcing things can be a good idea in some cases. You could certainly outsource things like creating an infographic or creating an ebook. Um, I would be a bit careful with um, stuff you can buy, what's known as private label rights content, which is content that someone's written for, uh, that they sell to a number of people for reuse. If you decide to put that on your blog, however, there's a chance that uh, if someone might have used it before and you might get a duplicate content penalty, which means you might have to rewrite it, which means you're probably just better off writing your own thing anyway. 
So onto the plugins, these are all on the repository and they're mostly free. Um, a couple have got paid services or upgrades, which I'll talk about. Um, this is better click to tweet, um, and it just puts a little button into the post editor with a little Twitter word on it. When you click on it, you get a pop-up box and you put your quote in. You can choose to add your own uh, Twitter handle to it. It generates a short code and then uh, the bit on the bottom is what it actually looks like on the front end. And you've got that little click to tweet link there. And it just makes a little bit of interest and encourages more social sharing. <coughs> Broken link checker. Guess what this one does? Yeah, broken links are not good for SEO and they're not good for user experience. There's nothing more frustrating than have lots of links on your site that just lead nowhere. And this runs in the background for you and sends you an email every so often warning you what links are broken. And often they can be comment links because somebody might comment, um, you know, so at one point and then uh, months down the line, their blogs disappeared, but the link's still there and it's broken. One thing to watch out for is that this can be a bit of a resource hog, this plugin, and some hosts have actually banned it. Uh, Call Schedule is what I use as my editorial calendar. This plugin is free, but the service is not, it's a paid service. And I use this to plan content and to aggregate ideas for content. Um, it also shows me for each um, post that I put out how many social shares I've had. And the real um, other big benefit for me is it's got this social sharing built in. So you can actually set up once you post something, you can say, right, I, I want this tweeted out a day from now, a week from now, a month from now. And once you've set it up, it's, it's all ready to go. Jetpack is a bit of a love-hate plugin. No, not everyone likes it. I happen to like it. Um, there's a few features here um, I've, I've got on top left is the Gravatar hover card. So that's just that little pop-up box when somebody hovers over a Gravatar on a comment. Um, underneath, we've got the related posts. I think that's useful because if somebody comes to your blog and they're interested in WordPress and that you've got a category, then you can show them other posts in the same category. To keep them on your site, that'd be longer. Um, the site stats, I think, are probably a bit inflated, but I do watch them regularly. They're kind of fun. And right at the bottom right, we've got the subscriptions module. And that allows people to subscribe to your blog and also to subscribe to comment threads as well. Uh, this is Sumo Me, another one that's free, but there are some of the tools in it have got paid upgrades. And this does a whole heap of things as well. Um, it's mainly for email list building and for social sharing. Um, you can see right at the top, I've got the heat map tool turned on, so that's actually showing me on a page what did people actually click on. So it looked like they were clicking on the links, which is good. Underneath, a tool called the highlighter, and that allows people to highlight text. Uh, and then once they've highlighted it, they can sh uh, social share it out. Um, right at the bottom is the content analytics, and you might think, hey, I've got the best blog in the world, but this is actually showing you, if you set it up, how much of your post people actually read. So you want nice high scores on this. And above that is my opt-in box that uh, pops up uh, when you scroll right down to the bottom of the page. But they have a whole heap of opt-ins. They've got those ones that pop out right in the middle of the screen, which I personally don't like. But I understand that they are very effective. And they've got the one, which you call, I think, the welcome mat, and that pretty much Someone lands on a page, and that's the first thing that they see, and then they have to scroll down to see your content. And finally, plugin-wise, who uses Yoast? Yeah, quite a lot of you, and I do too for all my own page SEO. And if you use it, you know the object is to get the, the green light on everything. Um, they have gone and changed it around quite a lot lately, which has got a little bit annoying. I'm still persisting with it, though. Uh, the sitemap function is pretty useful as well. 
So now moving on to uh, more web-based tools. Um, writing headlines is really important for your blog posts because if you don't grab the reader's attention with a headline, then they're not going to click right through and read. So the top tool here is a tool I use for crafting better headlines called Schedule Headline Analyzer. And the way this works is it comes up with a score for the headline. So it takes a number of things. It will work out how many words are in it and warn you if there's too many or too few. And it will show you if you've got too many and it's going to get cut off in the search preview. It analyzes the word balance of your headlines. So it does it on four different types of words, common words, uncommon words, emotional words, and power words. And the latter two, emotional and power words, are the ones that are going to grab people and get them to click through. It tells you what kind of type of headline you got. So if you start your headline with a number, it immediately recognizes a list. And as we know, lists are insanely popular. And it also tells you, finally, what the sentiment of your headline is. So you want to be really positive or really negative, ideally, because that's going to get people more emotionally than if it's just neutral and flat. Uh, well, underneath, I have Google Analytics, which I'm sure a lot of you will use as well for tracking stats. Uh, the one thing I would say with that is watch out for referral spam. Um, I discovered all about that last year. <laughs> I ended up writing a blog post on it because it's just uh, kind of people manipulating and trying to boost their numbers and uh, skewing all your um, results. Um, now we're on to Longtail Pro. Um, I've actually got the Longtail Platinum version here. This is a paid tool. Um, Platinum is like an extra upgrade. Uh, it links to Google Keyword Planner but it's kind of a slightly nicer interface. And it just shows you all sorts of metrics for uh, search keywords. The Platinum version's got something called keyword competitiveness, which they've calculated. And what you're looking for with that one is to get a nice low score in it. And that tells you it's something good to write about. If you get under 30, that would be ideal. You can also use this to see what the top 10 results are for any particular key phrase. So you can go and look at your competition and decide, well, if it's all really, really huge, massive traffic sites, you might think, maybe I'll not get much chance of ranking for this. Uh, underneath, we have SEO Edge, and that is an iOS app. And it's free to use for up to five keywords. You can track them in the Google rankings. and. It produces a little graph, so you can see that the positions can actually go up or down. I find that if you do get lucky enough to get something in the top 10, it does tend to stick there. Um, there's another online rank checker, um, and that's called the search rank checker, and I, I use that one as well. Um, these tools are more for actually putting together the, you know, the content of your posts. Uh, I'm lucky, my mum's an English teacher, so I've been blessed with good spelling and grammar, um, but I still find it helpful sometimes to, to use tools. Uh, Grammarly is the top one here, which is web app and a Chrome extension, and that corrects your spelling and grammar. It, it warns you straight away if you have got an error, which I find can get a bit annoying, because my typing isn't always that good, and I can just mistype things, and it immediately warns me. Uh, there is a premium version available from this, and I have to say I haven't tried it because it's quite expensive. Underneath, we've got the Hemingway editor, and that is a web app. You can also get it as a paid desktop app. That gives you a number of things like how many words you've written and the time to read. I quite like seeing that on a blog post, you know, read in six minutes or whatever. The main purpose of it, though, is to simplify your writing down. So it warns you about if you've got sentences that are hard to read or very hard to read. I do think it could be a wee bit prescriptive. It warns you about things like you're using the passive voice, you're using adverbs, these are bad. I don't think those things are bad per se. I think you just have to use your own common sense and judgment. So as far as blogging goes, don't just take my word for it that it's good. There's a few quotes here from people about how it's helped them. Um, so for Rachel, she found 
that blogging has helped her get new visitors and it shows off her expertise and ultimately it's helped her to get hired. For Jo, if she blogs, then she's showing that she's a helpful person and she's building that know and like and trust factor with her readers. And Paige, uh, she was on the blogging challenge with me. Uh, her big benefit has been to just get to know her audience. I started off pretty much like her, not really knowing who my audience was. And now she's got to that stage that she knows and she's developing her own products. So I hope to have some time for questions, and I have some time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. That was pretty exhausting. The questions are coming thick and fast, so we'll get straight to them. Yes, here we go. Hi. Um, thank you for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, do you happen to have a writer's block, and how do you fight it? Because as for me, um, blogging is something I'm yet to master, and uh, I find it very hard to keep up with the schedule. So um, I created a rule for myself to write at least 50 words for a day. So do you have any secrets like this or, yeah? Uh, overcoming racist block. Um, yeah, I think it's just making that time and just making yourself right. But I suppose if you're not really in the mood to do it, then, you know, put it aside, go off, do something else, have a cup of coffee, come back to it or something. Because I think sometimes I can write something and then just get really sick of it and then it's like anything if i come back to it then i've got a fresher mind and i'm able to to concentrate on it more thank you hi um our team was using grammarly and because of the technical language you have to use in internet and seo world it was driving us crazy have you got any tips about settings and stuff we probably didn't give it enough attention but it started driving us mad so we had to turn it off um, I think, yeah, you, you can turn it off uh, on, um, yeah, individual pages and things like that, yeah. Um, I haven't used it for probably long enough. I know it does sort of send you those reports and it sort of says, you know, how, how well you're doing overall with it and you are like, I don't know, 95% better at something than the average person. But yeah, if it, I would just say if it gets too annoying, then, then just, just turn it off for a time and maybe just put it back on right when you're at the very end and you're ready to edit. Okay, more questions. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Claire. Uh, one of uh, the most challenge, uh, challenges I've faced with uh, my blogs is uh, the spam comments or the bogus comments. Uh, what would be the best way to counter uh, those who send in uh, well, spam comments? All right. Um, well, I use Akismet, which is automatically um, installed for you with WordPress. You have to subscribe to their service. I think it's uh, $5 a month, although I've now gone to the yearly plan. Um, there is another one that I know of called Anti Spam B, which is another. It was a free um, spam comment plugin. But yeah, you definitely need to have one of those in there. It's uh, Kismet's pretty good. It catches most of the spam. I think very occasionally I, you know, have the odd comment that slips through. And recently, I actually had one where uh, somebody told me they'd commented, and uh, I only knew that uh, it had gone into the spam because they told me they'd left a comment. Um, but other than that, I would say it's good. I recommend it. Thanks, Claire. Great talk. Um, you mentioned about um, you know knowing your audience, you know, using the blogging to learn more about audience. I just wondered how you actually sort of, because you were quite specific on some elements there, was it that you judge what they're doing from the comments that they make on your blog, or is there some other insights that you, um, you, got, you use to uh, get that information? Well, I've had one or two people leave comments and then that's maybe given me more ideas because I think I wrote about 2015 theme and then I thought th the natural thing to do after that was write about making a child theme for it. And, and I've had the same sort of thing writing about 2016 as well. Um, and yes, I forgot to mention this is... Um, yeah, keep an eye on just what people are asking you and you can go to a site like Quora.com and type in um, something that's related to your niche and you can see all the kinds of questions that people are asking about that and that could be quite fertile ground for you to find things to write about. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, do we have any more questions from the floor? Yes, at the back there. I have less of a question and more of a, a helpful tool. It takes me ages to write blog posts because I'm constantly rewriting and re-editing as I write. And a 500-word blog post could take me half a day. What I started doing was uh, dictating it and sending the MP3 to a transcri transcriber on Fiverr.com. So a blog, po blog post now takes me five minutes to write and five dollars to have transcribed. Brilliant. Can't recommend it highly enough. Well, that's the ultimate note sourcing, isn't it? <laughs> Instead of sending it to Fiverr.com, there's um, a free dictation app on your iPhone and a, a very good dictation app for your iMac or your PC. It's Dragon Dictation. It's unbelievable. So it works really well. You can, you can speak this fast, and it's faster than those ladies over there. Dragon Dictation. <laughs> Obviously not as good. So uh, I, actually, I had a little question. So there was a, a thing about putting blogs live that I did hear from someone who worked in SEO, and this was some years ago, that it was actually could be really helpful to schedule the time of day that a particular blog goes up. And I wondered if you'd sort of looked at that and whether you, you looked at different sorts of audiences for your posts and, and how you schedule maybe at the sort of micro scale, like less than a day. Detail. Yeah, I don't tend to schedule a lot, but I, it, it, I think it comes in relevant when you're actually doing the sharing. That I find that if I send out, you know, tweets like certain times a day, I think I find between like eight and nine in the morning is quite a good time to do that because I, I think people are maybe commuting or something and they just happen to be looking at their phones and saying what's come up, that kind of thing. But in terms of publishing posts, it tends to be just when I've written them, then it's yeah. going to go out. And at the moment, I'm trying to stick to every Friday. I, and the other one, the blogging challenge look particularly interesting. You did touch on a few that had been harder. Were there any that you either got sort of picked a subject and really regretted having bitten it off? Or, I mean, this is like a general one as well. Like, do you ever sort of post something and sort of think a, a week or maybe even later, go back and you change your mind completely and want to rewrite it? And would you do a follow up post or would you actually edit the old um. one? I have had to revisit a few because I've, I've written something like, um, what, one of my popular ones is actually about um, Edinburgh networking groups. And I've had to just go back and revisit that every so often because the information's got out of date. Um, and I think, yeah, that is something that you have to do periodically. If it's, if it's not sort of evergreen information, then you, you, you have to just keep an eye on what's there. Would that be an edit of the original post or like another thing in a common category? Well, I ended up just rewriting it and then just putting a little note at the top saying oh, okay. revised on. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there are some people who actually don't put dates on at all on their blog, um, which could be viewed as a little bit disingenuous because I think I like to know when it was written. Um, yeah. But I can see that there's some logic to that because if you don't put a date on, then, you know, it's going to be seen as evergreen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, your slides are basically going to have all the tools listed that you spoke about, and I guess if we should keep visiting a bright, clear web to see the new tools that you play with and read the reviews. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for the great questions on the floor. Um,